Okay, everybody, let's get started. Last short session of the afternoon. Um, and what we have right now is a phenomenon called three tired instructors. <laughs> so we're going to sit down and we're just going to chime in. Um, and we're going to just give you some suggestions and some ideas about um, decisions regarding names. Okay? There's a genus name on a soda. So, what are the real rules? We already went over these. Has to be two or more letters, and it has to be Latinized correctly. Meaning, it has to be in correct grammar. <laughs> <laughs> because town will be silently correcting your grammar. <laughs> Wait, how do you spell grammar? <laughs> okay, so what are your options? You can name it after a person. So that is a patronym if it's a man, or a matronym if it's a woman. And so um, a good candidate for that is Otis Peterson I. Unfortunately, it's not named after me. It's named after Roger Torrey Peterson. Uh, but my advisor named it after Roger, Roger Torrey Peterson within months of my arrival as his student at the University of Chicago in the Field Museum, so I always insisted that it was really named after me. Uh, you can name species after places. You guys jump in whenever you want. Uh, so Otis mindorensis is a species of owl that is found only on the island of Mindoro in the Philippines. Um, or you can use traits. So for example, Otis rufescens is a reddish colored owl, or at least the material they had available to them was reddish colored. One of my favorites is the hupo, um, which is named Apapaipops. And it has a crest that goes like this. And I don't know for a fact, it must be a Linnaean name, but it certainly appears to describe the behavior. Okay, this one's yours, Rafe. Uh, you can name species for, um, for morphological or other phenotypic traits. You can name them explicitly for autapomorphies. Remember, autapomorphies were the um, uniquely derived morphological characters, and in this case, uh, here's an example of a, uh, of a platymantis, one of these shrub frogs from the Pacific, that um, is unique amongst all of, its close, all of its relatives, and then it has a row of bright yellow spots down the side of its body. Citrinos is, um, means yellow or golden, and spilus means spots. So numbering is certainly a possibility, which is to say, um, in the genus Batrachostomus, which is one of the, the uh, taxa closely related to the Caprimulgids that we just talked about, there were six species and a seventh was discovered, I believe, on the Philippines. And I guess somebody was feeling very uninspired about names, and so instead of naming it after the place or the traits or a person, it was, well, this is the seventh one, so Batrachostomus septimus. But then we can go into jokes and politics. I think you guys can explain these. There seems to be a, a really long, uh, rich tradition of, of naming uh, new species with clever derivations and clever um, specific epithets, specific meaning epithets is the name uh, that, that codifies the species. Um, and the, the tradition of coming up with clever um, riddles and jokes in the formation of the species name is pretty rich in taxonomy um, and shows you to the, ex the extent to which uh, a lot of science geeks sit around and think up really silly stuff. So here's a really silly one. It's one of my all-time favorites. This is Lepidodactylus balioburius which is a small uh, little brown lizard, um, palm gecko, or a little ha gecko, in the northern, the islands between the Philippines and Taiwan. 
and Balio means, uh, I think is Greek, or I think it's Greek for brown, and Boreas means beast. And the uh, author of that species name said, uh, this is an appropriate species. The name means brown and beast, and that's an appropriate name for a little brown animal, a little brown uh, reptile. Um, Balio Burris also, according to the author, uh, acknowledges significant contributions to Philippine herpetology by Walter Brown and Andy Ross. And the implication there is that Balio refers to Walter Brown, because it means brown, and Burrius uh, refers to Andy Ross. So uh, Walter, Brown, Walter Brown is the brown part of the name, and Andy Ross is the beast part of the name. Because he was like a, because he was a he was, if you knew from Andy Ross you might characterize him as a beast. Yeah, it's a big um, man. Big man. Yeah. Two others. One one here is um, actually I believe a Linnaean joke is Balaenoptera musculus, right? So that's one of the largest uh, animals there is, it's a whale, and musculus is little mouse, right? So it's it can be muscular but mus musculus is also a common name for you know small mice scientific name for mice so so linnaeus had a sense of humor yeah so Linnaeus this is the little mouse of a giant whale right so there was a, a bit of humor there and i have a colleague um bob drews who's a african herpetologist like me who works on sao tome and principe and during that work they discovered um, a new species of fungus in the genus phallus i mean phallus is named phallus because it looks like the male genitalia. But they named it Phallus Druzi after being the, in honor of Bob Druze, they named this the smallest member of the genus Phallus, was how that was written. So, you know, this is uh, Druze's penis fungus, basically. Um, which is a totally valid thing to name, but uh, this was, you know, it's partly a joke, of course, naming that after your colleague, right? And then politics? Generally frowned upon. Generally frowned upon. <laughs> There's been some. Uh, some uh, specific epithets, some species names um, named for political figures. And that either comes across as um, sort of, um, what is the word? Inappropriate. Inappropriate, sort of coupled with a bunch of platitudes and shows the author's political affiliation. And that's just generally sort of frowned upon in taxonomy and science in general. One of the first species that I named was a swift, like the one that that Sese grabbed the other day. Um, it was a swift from southwestern Mexico. And it was known from four specimens that had been all collected in one mountain range, very remote and very conflictive over the years. And there had been a, a guerrillero, a, a rebel named Lucio Cabañas, kind of in the decades after the Cuban Re Revolution. And he had hid out in that mountain range. And for decades, they, the Mexican authorities could not catch him. And so we came very close to naming that swift for Lucio Cabañas until my Mexican colleague was told, do that and you can probably forget about any national funding for your research in the future. So we didn't. Anything else about names? Any questions about names? Any questions about names? Yeah. But we're going to have a, a few more slides here. So. so if you're going to name it after a person, you have some good options, and then you have some other options that are probably more and more frowned upon. So certainly, if the collector did something out of the ordinary, uh, to collect the animal, it's quite common to honor the collector. So in the Philippines, you have quite a number of species named rabori after a professional collector in, in the Philippines. In Cameroon, there's a lot of species, Cameroon Gabon, named Batesi or Batesii. Uh, that are named for George Latimer Bates, who was an American ornithologist. Um, but during that time in Cameroon, he collected lots and lots of things that he didn't himself describe, but people named after him. Then sometimes you'll have a species that can be named after the person who figured out that it was different, but maybe didn't, um, didn't identify, didn't actually go ahead and describe it. 
I don't have an example. So we, I have two examples point. from Cameron and Nigeria, actually, of um, you know, scientists that worked in the 60s that essentially wrote the diagnosis but called it a different species that was already described because they just they didn't have enough resources at hand to realize it was a new species. Uh, but in characterizing it in their faunal accounts, basically, you know, described it, provided all the traits that are how to diagnose it. And so in those cases, I've named them after um, th those scientists that wrote those descriptions. A mentor. So that swift that we did not name after uh, Lucio Cabañas, we named after a uh, curator at the University of Michigan who had been a wonderful mentor to both myself and my co-author. Um, you know, to me, even back when I was in high school, and I visited the University of Michigan, and he was very kind and very encouraging from then until his death. And so we were sitting around trying to figure out what to name this, this Swift, and finally somebody said, Bob Storer. And everybody agreed. It was an ideal choice. A funder or a patron is another option. This has become more and more common, actually, as there's private funding for science and expeditions, for people to name species in honor of those people who may have supported them, whether or not it's an organization or an individual that you know supplied money. There's certainly people that raise <laughs> funds for doing expeditions and field work now. Um, that is part of it is you know naming species after those people that supplied funding. And then in gray, there are some ideas that, well, they would be valid, but maybe they're not encouraged so much. So your wife, your girlfriend, your husband, your boyfriend, your best friend, your dog, your cat, your goldfish, um, things that are personal and not in the science realm or perhaps not not so acceptable these days, but would be valid names if you were to use them properly. So then some comments about proper grammar. And don't ask too many questions about this because at least I am not completely sure of this, uh, but this will get you close at least. If you use a noun in apposition, uh, which is to say one noun after the genus, which is a noun, then you can use them, you can use the specific epithet without any ending, without any suffix that indicates number or gender. So an example of this in Cameroon, again, is the Goliath frog, which is the biggest frog in the world, is Kanrawa. Goliath, and that's what Dr. Fokum gave as an example earlier today. If you're going to use an adjective, then it has to match the genus that it is modifying. Okay, so, give an example, of course there are millions. You want me to give an example? Yeah, I'm, I'm, oh. I'm thinking quickly and meaning that. So, and, and not only does that matter, but if the if the genus name changes, the species name will change too, uh, in gender. So, for instance, one of the most famous and widespread problem amphibian species are the cane toads, which for many years were called Bufo marinus, right? And that's essentially male. But then Bufo, as Rafe talked about, was changed. Some of the genus names were changed, and that genus name was changed to Rhinella. And so Marinus was changed to Marina. And so Bufo Marinus has become Rhinella Marina. Right? And so when you have the female genus, then you have a female species. And, and you can get into problems, and there's one in ornithology that has been floating around for a long time. Um, and it's two genera that are a little too similar. So there's Gymnorhinus, which means bear bill, and Gymnorhina which means bear bill. Um, I believe that gymnorhina is neuter and gymnorhinus is masculine, but there's just been all sorts of debate about how to manage those. Essentially, those two genera are different only in their gender. So it's probably, I, I don't know the rules about that, but it's a mess. And so you have the species names 
um, kind of wobbling around also. Anyhow, it's a mess uh, and shouldn't have been allowed, but happened. Okay, then um, the, a noun used in possessive. So essentially, imagine going back to Otis Peterson I, that is the owl of Peterson. Again, not me. Um, but P-E-T-E-R-S-O-N-I means that it is one person named Peterson. But if you were naming it after the, yeah, M is, is masculine. If you were naming it after the Peterson family, then it would Peter, be Petersonorum, which is the plural possessive in Latin. And if, it, if you were naming it after a woman named Peterson, it would be Peterson A.E. Okay? And then one last is more of a recommendation that you avoid mixing words divide, de derived from Greek with words derived from Latin. Um, another, just in terms of proper endings, normally when you see place names, ensis, E-N-S-I-S, -S, on the end, is denoting that it's you know, of a place, right? So that's, that's the typical Latin ending for when you're naming the thing that came from a, a place. So gabonensis is one that would probably be familiar to many people here. It's a pretty common species epithet. Anybody think of anything else? Um, maybe you want to talk about um, local language names? Oh, yeah. That's nice. Oh, oh it's nice. That's right. Okay. That's right. Ah. So here are some good ideas, some recommended, at least in terms of uh, the opinions shared here, some good ideas for selecting you know, species names that, um, that uh, convey some information and give um, homage to um, either the area where they came from or the people who came from that area or the other, you know, other biodiversity that's found in that area. So one thing, first off, is you might want to check the possible names of the Latin scholar or check online Latin dictionaries, and there's a ton of Latin and Greek dictionaries online. So there's no reason you can't figure this out yourself. But if you do have a Latin scholar nearby, it's a good thing to just check and make sure that the parts of speech and the grammar are correct and that they mean something in Latin. Um, and then you always want to, of course, check and make sure that the name that you're choosing is not occupied previously and hasn't been used in the same genus previously, um, because if you name something with the same species, name, same, name a species, choosing the name, the same genus and species name, that's what's referred to as a homonym, and it's invalid, or you can't, you can't do that, and eventually it will have to be replaced by someone else who can, who can uh, as the first um, right, yeah, advisor sorry. in that situation, can just pick a name and replace your name. So you always want to make sure that the name is not occupied, because it's, it's already used. Uh, and, and, then, you can, and you can check that on many of those taxon databases we talked about earlier, and that's a good way to figure out, you know, is that name you're using already used for another animal or another plant? But do be aware that many of those databases just give kind of recent usage. I mean, I hope the HERP databases course, are, better. are better. But, yeah. um, but, you know, you really have to go back to Linnaeus, and any name that's been applied since Linnaeus you have to take into account. Yeah. Right. Again, uh, we like the idea of using local dialects and local names. And in those cases, you might be using a noun and apposition or something that frees you up from these constraints of having matching gender between the genus and species. But just choosing um, a noun in a, a local name um, or uh, a name of a mythological feature in the culture uh, that's there or a local language name for the animal, you know, mm -hmm. that's one of the things that, that I like to do that's really interesting. I work in, in, we've talked about before, I worked in the Philippines, which has about 180 different languages throughout this archipelago. And a lot of those um, languages have specific names for the species. And I always want to emphasize that when we quote unquote discover a new species, that's usually a false claim. Because usually the cultures that live in the vicinity of those taxa already have relationships with them and discovered them thousands of years before Western scientists got there. And a lot of them have names for those taxa in their local languages. And so when we go through the formal uh, description and describe a new species to science, to Western science, we can often just use the name that the local indigenous groups from that area used and give homage to their tribal group and to their relationship with that organism. 
And uh, I just think that's a great way to do it. But you can also just choose either the local name that people, people from that area use or something in their language that would be meaningful to them. Can I, I give them. some examples? Uh, a good one from in recent history is, um, is this large uh, monitor lizard that we discovered in, quote unquote, we discovered, quote unquote, in the Philippines. Um, and it was in the northern Philippines and it was very distinct and new to science and uh, made a lot of headlines because discovering a six foot monitor lizard is kind of fun and kind of a, an exciting discovery. But um, the, the Agta tribal group there had a name for it uh, and they, they, it was part of their language and they called it Bidatawa, which means, you know, that means that they have a relationship with that animal that goes back thousands of years and is part of their language and everybody there knows how to distinguish it from the other species of monitor that lizard, lizard that lives there. And so it made great sense for us to call it Varanus Bidatawa in their language and it was the perfect name for it, I thought. Hey, it's great. In Cameroon, we've asked local, uh, I was telling a couple people at lunch, uh, in Oku, so we've named some species from Oku, uh, and we've had the fawn and the sort of the elders that are part of that weigh in on names, and so we have a Xenopus species, that's Xenopus isuli, which is the local language name for that frog. Um, we had a species that for many years was called uh, Phryna betraca, species 11, unofficial in the liter literature, and so we got the name in Oku for the number 11, so Phryna betraca's Njiomok is what that is. Njiomok. In, um, in Tanzania, I've named a very, very tiny frog, uh, Arthroleptis kidogo. For those of you that work in, uh, from East Africa, kidogo means a little bit. Uh, it's like the one, one piece of uh, Swahili that a lot of Americans learn or Europeans learn when they go to East Africa is they know a little bit of Swahili, bit kidogo. Uh, so, you know, those things are not only fun, but they also help, you know, cultivate some sense of interest and responsibility from people that live locally. And, you know, as people that are interested in conserving biodiversity as well as describing it, you know, that's a great, it's a great tool to sort of get that local interest and involvement in the process. Any questions? No questions. So now you have your species in hand and you know what name you're going to apply to it. Thank you very much. I would uh, like to know how long it takes to name a new species, how long it can take. So how long does it take? Does it take to name a new species? So what are the steps in the process? We're kind of going to walk you through all of those steps. In theory, writing the description does not have to take long at all, which is to say, tomorrow morning we're going to start off with the question of how do you know that it's a new species? And if you can answer that question, sometimes it's very, very, very clear. So one of the first species new to science discoveries that I was involved in, I wasn't an author on the, on the description, uh, but I was in a, in a, on an expedition in Brazil and a, a very experienced ornithologist went out to check the nets and he came back and he was white in the face, I mean, just like he was scared. And he came back and he said, I just collected the best bird I've ever collected in my life. And so this is a, it's a family called Formicariidae, the ant birds. And um, one, two genera of ant birds have an upturned bill. So it's a normal bill like this. And then near the end, it just curves upward. And each genus at that point was mono, monotypic, one species in each of the two genera. This colleague knew essentially immediately that it was the genus Clytoctantes, but it, was a, it had an all over chocolate brown plumage and a black bib. And he knew that neither of the two species, neither Clytoctantes nor Neoctantes, those were the two genera, neither of them had either sex that had brown plumage and a black bib. So he knew immediately it was a species new to science. And the really cool thing was that the other Clytoctantes, the other member of the genus, was known only from thousands of kilometers to the north on the Venezuela-Colombia border. And so 
here we were in the southwest Amazon and this was from the, the closest relative, the only relative, was known from the extreme northern limit of tropical forest in northern South America. So there are times when that question of is it a new species is very easy and then there are times where that question might take you, you know, quite a bit of work. It might require sequencing, it might require detailed analysis. Looks like Dave has something to add to this. Yeah. I just add that, you know, there is a, also a history of species sitting on shelves in museums for decades before they're described, right? And sometimes that's just a necessity because the person that, you know, that particular genus had literally never been given attention by anyone. And it, it took 50 years for someone to show up and finally say, you know what genus I'm going to start working on is this one. And then, of course, they go through museum collections and quickly realize, oh, look at this. This new species was collected in the 1920s. And then they describe it. So there is this sometimes a very long time to describe things. But if you know and you're working on them that they're new, they can happen very quickly if you want them to. So the phases of the process are that you get around to it then that you actually make this decision that it is likely to be a new species. You do the measurements, comparisons, all of that, which is what we'll talk about tomorrow. You write the description, which, is, which can be between a few paragraphs and a few pages, or a full paper. Then you submit that to an academic journal, a peer-reviewed journal. And the peer review and publication process could take as little as a month or as much as a year. So it's not an immediate process, but it's also not a slow process, or it doesn't have to be a slow process. And, and one thing that speeds that up significantly is this move to electronic publication, right? Because you're not waiting a whole year for it to come out in paper form in a journal, right? And so one of the great possibilities of actually speeding up taxonomy is a move to online publication and some form of you know, electronically registering names as a way to speed that process up. One of my favorite um, examples along the line of what Dave was saying is a, uh, a new species of parrot on a little island in the Philippines. Uh, the island is called Camigan Sur, the southern Camigan. And uh, so the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago has the very best um, collections, at least at this point, at that point, um, from Camigan Sur. And they were back from the days of these professional collectors, especially a man named, named Rabor. So a previous curator at the Field Museum had worked on the birds of the Philippines and had produced a manuscript but, but passed away before it was published. Rand, Austin Rand. And so a colleague of mine was you know, basically curating a new, col a new collection of material. Uh, I don't know if it was from Camigan Sur or from elsewhere, but he had one of these little parrots um, and was putting it in the correct tray and pulled out the tray and noticed that, well, this one has a red spot on the chest, red spot on the chest, red spot on the chest, none, 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 none. And he just thought, wow, that's strange. No red spot on the chest for all of those. And he looked at them and he realized, oh, all of those are from Camigan Sur, and the birds from all the other islands have the red spot. And so he looked at it carefully, and yeah, it was, it was very consistent. And he looked to see if there was maybe a subspecies named. No, there wasn't a subspecies named from Camigan Sur. And they looked and they looked and they looked and they were convinced that this was a new taxon. Indeed it was. But just by chance, somebody remembered that Rand's manuscript on the birds of the Philippines, manuscript, mind you, Rand's manuscript was sitting in the Field Museum archives. And so just out of curiosity, knowing that Rand had worked on the birds of the Philippines, just out of curiosity, they went and looked at his manuscript. And when they looked at it, they went to that species, and there was the comment, the form 
you know, the population on Kamigan Sur is clearly a distinct species because of this, 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 this. And there was the description, but it had never been published. And so, you know, they, they obviously built the, the description of the species around honoring Rand for having realized this, but it took Rand so long, probably because he just felt he'd put it in his book and not publish it separately, it took him so long to publish it that he died before publication. And I believe that he asked one of the younger curators, Mel Trailer, who was one of the older curators when I was there, Rand asked Trailer to see that manuscript through to publication. And Trailer, I remember him telling me say, that, you know, Rand just left too much work to go on that on that book manuscript, so I never got around to it. And so Trailer felt bad, and so Rand's new species of parrot wasn't published until 80 years later. Another question? This is why it's great to have more people involved in the process of describing species, right? I mean, because we hopefully can let these things not happen by depending on just one or two or three people to do the taxonomy of a group. One last comment about how long it takes. Um, sometimes the taxonomy of a group is so neglected, it's such a mess, that although you know pretty much that you have a species that's new to science, the responsible thing is to rework the taxonomy of the whole group, maybe the whole genus or some species complex. And so what starts as, you know, I collected this animal and it's clearly new to science, turns into two or three years of work where you have to work through the systematics of the whole group. <laughs>